Hello, everybody. <clears throat> we'll wait a minute or two to let people come on. Tristan, are you with us? I am. I'm here. Okay. So maybe like 1232. Do you want to take a roll? Yeah. Okay. Tristan, one more favor. Can you grant me permission to share my screen? Yes. Permission granted. Thank you. All right, I'll start our roll call. You will start with Angela. Hello, good to see you. Good to see you, Angela. Sharon, Carol. Here, nice to see you. Dan Schmidt. Good afternoon, how's everyone? I think we're doing all pretty good. Thanks for asking. Diane Flagno. Hi everyone, here. Christine Egger. Here. I'm here. Thank you. Sorry, we're having. Let me get through the roll call real fast. Uh, we've got Dylan Klepmeyer. I'm here. Erica Allen. I am here. Jewel Walker. Good afternoon. I'm here. Nicole Flynn. Hey everyone, I'm here and I apologize my camera's off. I'm having some computer issues today so I may be switching over to my phone later. No worries, thank you. Uh, Nick Schumacher. Yeah, here from beautiful Southeast Montana. Wonderful. Mike Perry. I am back in the lower 48. Good to see everybody. <laughs> Philip Corbett. Hello. Present. Bow, Bauer. I'm here. Good afternoon. Um, did we do Dean? Good afternoon from Great Falls. I think that's everyone. Thank you, Tristan. And welcome, everybody. Great attendance. Hope everybody had a great week. <clears throat> ramp up if you're at a school district for school to start sooner rather than later at this point. And we get to fast and furious in, the, in our everyday world with that soon. So we will continue our discussion of chapter 57. I'm gonna rip through the um, agenda objectives for today. We will review all the normal stuff. We're going to talk about endorsements, which we didn't have a group that focused on endorsements, but we have some bullet points to guide our discussion around obtaining endorsements, uh, some potential barriers that exist with that in the state of Montana currently. <clears throat> then we're going to look at where we are and what we've discussed so far. Uh, so in an effort to have some broad recommendations that Crystal can report to the superintendent at the conclusion of this meeting in terms of areas of focus that this group has talked about help us move forward into our next steps and we'll look at our schedule uh, specifically as we know school is starting and, and how we might need to adjust but what we are tasked with doing at this point so that's what we're going to cover today uh, i think we're all good with this everybody's been here before just uh, use the hand if you can communicate via the chat 
if you need to, we do our best job to monitor that. And, and Kim, please keep your mic on mute. Always be respectful, supportive, present, and open. We are fully aware that everybody is bought into this. We uh, may today, if all things go well, uh, take an actual vote uh, to agree upon the high level recommendations that we've discussed so far. And to do that, we will uh, take a roll call vote for that. We will need greater than 60% to be able to move forward with those and let those move on to the superintendent. So endorsements, um, let's talk about endorsements after Sharon talks. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. I had a couple of questions from last week. I felt like uh, I kind of ran out of time and I didn't really want to interrupt anybody. So this is with regard to Deputy Superintendent Allen's statement about the praxis last week. She um, made a brief statement about that there is evidence that the praxis is ineffective. And um, then I didn't get a chance to ask her a question because I think she logged in and logged out really quickly. Um, so I might be a little bit confused about our role here if we're actually really ready to clarify, to, to solidify some recommendations, especially about that item to the superintendent at the end of this meeting. I guess what I'd like to see then, and maybe I'm a little bit confused about our role here, but I guess I'd like to see more evidence about that praxis um, in, in effectiveness because I'm not sure that I had a chance to actually see where that study came from. Um, so that, that was my big question about after last week's um, session. So I do not know what specific study su Assistant Superintendent Allen was referencing. Uh, Crystal, maybe we can put that on our to-do to pass along and ask her if she can provide that. Um, but I, I skipped ahead to the end, Sharon. Uh, when I say high level recommendations, uh, really what I'm saying is that what we would put forward is, uh, we talked about the praxis uh, for, uh -huh. initial, for, uh, for initial license and the group would like to discuss keeping or moving it. That's currently okay. the, where the, what the recommendation is. Nothing, okay, okay. Nothing specific outside of, okay. we think this is an area where we should focus and, and have, a, have additional discussion about it. Uh, Certainly. So we're not, we're not moving into like, Get rid of it or or change okay. it to this point just that yeah it's a thing and and we should we should discuss more about that absolutely understood so i can say that along that those lines while we're here there there are studies that exist that do not show a strong correlation between praxis score and teacher effectiveness um, but that doesn't mean it's not useful necessarily. Um, you know, I think it, uh, I think it depends on what sort of study you're looking at and would not necessarily, depending on, well, it depends on what group you look at as to what the recommendation is in terms of keeping it or not. So, uh, Philip. Yeah, I just, um, if you could go back to your, your last slide, please, uh, Mr. Williams. Um, I thought our focus here was on reciprocity. So when I look at that in-state teachers keep or remove it, I didn't think there was a lot of, um, well, maybe there was, but as far as like I had mentioned last week, as long as that's with a, what we would assume as a teacher preparation program, I think it has a place. I thought our focus was on those folks coming out of state that already have experience. Do we need to require, you know, basically that, you know, burden of, oh, we're going to give you a class 5A because you're going to have to wait a year or you have a year to take this praxis, which they have probably taken already from their previous state. So you are correct. Um, what, if you see, just look above, I, what I captured uh, in collaboration with Crystal and Eric from the conversation last week was that there was um, a, 
there was a, dis a discussion that was more clear than not among the group that the praxis requirement uh, for out-of-state applicants who had previously obtained a license um, may not be a necessity, but there was no clarity around in-state, uh, especially in light of Superintendent Allen's comment as to whether it was useful or not. So that's sort of like why it's keep or remove, question mark, more discussion to be had uh, around that because I did not feel that we discussed that at all, that the, the group who talked about assessments, their recommendation was uh, to keep it for initial license, um, but we really didn't have a chance to dig into that discussion. So when we get to this point, Philip, uh, if we feel like that's not something we even wanna bring up, then we just decide not to bring it forward. <clears throat> Diane. I just have a question on the praxis even for initial um, licensure. And I'm specifically wondering about the effectiveness uh, of the practice in terms of our uh, Native American potential candidates. And uh, is there, are there particular studies that show uh, specifically that? Um, category of licensees or potential licensees, and if that is a uh, more of a barrier than a help, or is it legitimate for that group? I, I just would like us to look a little deeper into different areas, if we could, and different types of licensees. So, uh, Julie Mergel had mentioned last week. Um, that they had requested I think, pass rate data from mm -hmm. Praxis. Um, she, to her knowledge, last week, I don't think she knew if she had got that yet. And that was one reason why Montana was not included in the report that was referenced. Uh, Angela has unmuted. Angela, do you have knowledge of, the, of that at all pass rate for students who are Native American? The NEA did a study a while ago, um, and it's out there, and it does point to disparate outcomes on the praxis for uh, African Americans um, and other people of color. I will see if I can't find that study. Thanks. Any other comments on this, knowing that we will come back to it again in this meeting as well, but doesn't mean we can't discuss it now. Sharon. Yeah, I like the idea of coming back to this again. I, I think that our praxis requirement for initial licensure ha um, has a place, and a, a, I think it has a strong place in our teacher preparation programs. Um, uh, is that is that where they're at right now? And those folks from Montana State or or from the Montana University system can maybe answer that later, or just be prepared to answer that later. But that's certainly one of my questions: is that where is it right now in our teacher preparation programs? I can I speak on this? Please, please do. Back, ahead, Karina. I don't. Uh, agree that it should have a place in, and um, only because I, I have really mixed messages on the praxis itself and, and it does not decide if a teacher is good or not. And so to keep them from ever teaching because they don't have the praxis requirement is, I, I don't agree with it. So to answer, this is Julie, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I'm just in a, in a, in a corner of a, of a hotel here. Um, so the um, requirements for the in-state preparation programs for the 10 that Sharon was asking about is part of, and it is built within their education prep program into what they call the MAC, uh, which is a 10 point system. Um, and the Praxis is one component of that, as well as their GPA and as well as their um, Kind of scores that they get in their student teaching. Um, so it is built within the education preparation program. 
Um, and so you have to get a certain score on that to get some points in order to then um, pass for that body of evidence within the MAC. For out-of-state people, um, they take the praxis. Um, and so that's a separate requirement for out-of-state. In terms of the um, passing scores, the passing scores and the tests that they take based upon the endorsement area um, are the same for both out-of-state and in-state. Um, I am working on getting that data for you guys in terms of the Praxis results, because we talked about that last week. I'm not sure if it's to the level that maybe would be helpful for um, what Diane is asking and maybe to also share kind of what, what Karina is, is alluding to, if you will. But I'm working on getting that data for you guys. In terms of how desegregated it is, I may need to look a little bit deeper. John, you have your hand up. Yeah, Julie said a lot of the, the same things I was going to say. Um, we do offer, or we do require the praxis um, it's not actually part of our program. It is a uh, licensure requirement. And so uh, we have students who can actually complete our program, graduate, get their degree, but they can't get their license until they pass the praxis. And so we have it built into the program. We want them to do it before student teaching, ideally pass it before they student teach. Um, but the requirement is a requirement of OPI for license. It's not one of our requirements for graduation. So it's it's a it's an interesting uh, uh, wicket there. Um, I think one of the things that we were talking about last week is uh, actually that MAC as a whole. Uh, I brought up that is part of the highly qualified system, and, and we're no longer under highly qualified. So, is there a way through the licensing committee that we could look at how we recommend people? Um, you know, going back to that focus groups that you did some of the things that came out of there is that the person's ability to be a successful teacher is more important than this multiple measures of content knowledge. And so are there some different ways maybe that we could look at what we do with folks to show that they're ready to go into the teaching profession? Um, and, and if it's uh, the practice we keep offering, the practice, if there's something different that we could offer, maybe there's something different, um, but really looking at how we recommend people from our programs who are going into teaching um, that they're ready to be teachers, not necessarily that they can, they, they can pass the praxis. And, and so that's kind of where that conversation was uh, last week. And uh, um, Sharon, I don't know if that answers your question, but what kind of the best I've got at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Additional conversation. We will come back to it, I promise. Dan. All right, so what we just heard then is that the, the praxis is only an OPI requirement to satisfy the arm and the university system doesn't even use the data from the praxis as a part of, of their period. So with that being said, um, <clears throat> this really does just lie with how it applies to um, licensing and nothing else. Is that the total sum of that whole situation? John, can you confirm that? That is what I heard you say. We do use the praxis uh, as a measure of content, but it's not one of our program requirements. So we, we use it, we look at the data, we study it, we see how are people doing in those content areas compared to that exam. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a requirement from the state, not a requirement from the university. But a candidate does not need to pass the praxis to obtain their degree and complete your program. That is correct. So this is a call that I had actually with Julie last week about a candidate who had completed a degree program, but has not passed the praxis and is trying to work through a campus to try and get um, a class five, um, but needs the recommendation of the campus to do so. So Julie, do you want to elaborate on, on our conversation a little bit from last week? Sure, and um, so what you guys are talking about now is kind of the university recommendation. Um, and so in order to get a class five provisional license, 
Um, you need to have um, you need to have a plan of study, if you will, um, and then you have to meet you know the background checks and all of the requirements. You can get a 5A, which is a one-year license, provisional license, if you meet all of the requirements except for um, have not passed the praxis. And so um, we had a, a, had a candidate who, um, who does want to apply for a provisional and get the 5A to have, the one, to have that one year to, to pass that praxis. Um, but it's requiring that the university sign off on the university recommendation that they met the requirements for the endorsement for the program. Erica, you have your hand up. I just, um, it, it is in looking at bringing teachers in from out of state, is there anything individual in the um, praxis that is state specific that we're looking for specific information and are there other ways that we can assess um, whether they have that knowledge whether people in state or out of state are there other um, assessments that other states are using that we could also use so the answer to your first question is no there's nothing state specific about the praxis um, and the discussion here would be teachers who are coming from other states with an active license, then they would have passed whatever the requirements, whether they be testing or not testing in the state where they're coming from to obtain that license. I, th I think the key indicator is, do they have a license or not? And why would it be any different for the state versus, for out of state versus in state? The bottom line is I don't, I don't believe the dictator of Mongolia needs to be a part of the praxis requirement, whether or not they're a good teacher or not. That's just an example. So to answer the question about out-of-state candidates, regardless if you have a license in another state, you still have to take the praxis and that's the only exam that currently um, is available to meet that licensure requirement. Why do you need that exam is what I'm, I guess what I'm asking, why do we need that? So just specific to out-of-state, I think last week's discussion, the determination was it wasn't necessary for out-of-state teachers. The discussion was not had, which we're sort of having now around in-state as to whether or not it's necessary or not. Christine. Our group did the assessments and found that I believe 41 states have a, a praxis or another test that they require for their teachers to get their certification in their programs at the college level. So it's redundant for us to have them take it again or another, the praxis versus their similar test they just took with the reciprocity. So if I could add something to, I think this whole conversation and all of these recommendations, um, we have four bullet points here as, as high level recommendations. And I guess the way that I, and maybe a few others on this committee, perhaps have been looking at what you have here, which are clearly items that continue to emanate out of several of our conversations. And even today there's a lot of interest uh, in moving some of these pieces forward but they are parts of, of other pieces of what we might address within the chapter. Um, and, and, and as a loan, as, as a standalone item, or even you know group, grouped as a four, for me, they may not paint the whole picture of how we get to where we want to go with ensuring flexibility and, and how we get the teachers to where we want them to go and how do we get them to stay there. And so I guess what I would also add to this list is, is maybe two steps. Um, and, and one would be um, uh, perhaps that some uh, work is done, uh, research is done on the tiered licensure piece. 
uh, and what is happening and its impact in the places where it has been uh, employed across the country and perhaps a presentation made to this group in the coming weeks so that we can consider that with all of this. And then once that would happen, perhaps I, I would recommend that, uh, that, that a committee of this group be assigned to start to draft language around that. If there is interest, that would embody all four of these bullet points, but also perhaps uh, consider uh, that tiered licensure piece. Because what we have here, I think, is four pieces of something that is of, um, that even as, even together uh, cannot be considered, I think, as part of the whole of, of what needs to be considered and done. Um, for example, I think what we do with, with the five-year experience um, and, and whether we reduce that or eliminate that, that's going to depend on what we do with other areas of Chapter 57. And I, and I think that might be the case for other folks on here, and I'd love to hear more about that. But, just quickly, my, my, my recommendations would be we need to have a presentation on what that tiered licensure looks like. We need to hear some information, some, some results of research done in some of those states. And then if there is interest in, in, in taking a look at that and changing some language that would include these folks, uh, the, these bullet points, uh, then maybe we attach a, a subcommittee to do that work and we, we go after it and then present those as maybe overall recommendations but I think we're getting pieces and parts here and maybe not the whole. And I don't know if that's in the best interest of our, of our overall efforts at flexibility and in really trying to drive teachers to where we need them and get them to stay. John, you have your hand up? Yeah, hi, hi. Um, how's everybody doing today? I was just going to take a look and and uh, when we were considering the three and five years on the second bullet point, for instance, um, on the out of the state teachers, and I just wanted to come back to that just for a second. You know, I started asking around, and and my my relatives, uh, brother in law, sister, and and niece are all um, graduates in the, from the education programs in in Montana, and they've all fled the state. Um, and my niece most recently, this this last year, with no teaching experience, uh, she has um, has successfully passed the the art praxis and will be teaching uh, first year in Alaska this coming year. So, so I'm not I'm not sure, you know, if, if we need to have some further consideration around whether there's five years of experience, three years of experience, or simply passing a praxis or some other similar test in order to bring these people in from out of state. Obviously, other states are doing the same, are, are bringing people in, bringing teachers in who have no teaching experience but have passed the praxis. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Sean. Go ahead, Diane. Thank you. This is this is an area that I'm real interested in as well. So uh, I would like to see more information on, uh, and I know we have the reciprocity study. I'd like to be able to review that more in depth as a part of the committee if I could, if I'm not sure how exactly we'll do that, but I'd be interested in looking at that. And I am particularly interested in what we can do as a representative for teachers, what we can do to work to retain our teachers once they go to a district and, and sign on and move, what, how we can support them more. So that's, that's an area of interest I have that might make me interested in, in reducing what we, we require before they come. So I'm going to derail us a bit here and, and ask Angela, you've talked multiple times about the consideration of that support aspect for teachers. Can you clarify that? Does your, is your vision that that fits within the tiered system? And so the tiered system exists and then outside of the chapter understood within this tiered system as that's happening, there is support simultaneously happening for the, for the teachers or is there some mandated piece of support that's actually in the chapter itself? So, so um, I, I think I really appreciate um, your request there. I think it, it's, 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 it gives me a real good opportunity. So, um,
Okay, I just got muted. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think we have a real opportunity here, and, and I think Diane hit the nail on the head uh, in, in, in retaining our teachers. And so uh, Sean said it so well. I mean, really, we need to address what we're going to do to draw people to our state, simplify this process, maintain quality at the same time, but really make it a, a, a you know, a, ensure flexibility. And so how can we do that? Uh, while also driving folks to some of these areas where they're needed the most and then keep them there. And so to your your question, Jacob, I think we have a real opportunity, whether it is with pre, whether it is with pre-service teachers who are just short of completing, or whether it is with out-of-state teachers who want to come to Montana. And, and right now we have this five year of years of experience, which right now demonstrates to all of us in our school districts and in the Office of Public Instruction uh, that, that they've attained experience and competence, et cetera. Uh, and we're, we're suggesting maybe that we move away from that. Then we talk even about our, our brand new licensees who are fresh graduates of our EPPs. I think we have a real opportunity to provide um, the first license in Montana that would allow them uh, the chance to teach in Montana, um, whether we have the practice or whatever, but it would allow them the chance to teach in Montana, but it would also uh, at the same time uh, require them to uh, work with their district or with an EPP to ensure that they have at least two years, and this is just what I'm rattling around in my head and thinking about what could work, make sure that they have at least two years of a mentorship program. So that if we're gonna open the doors for an out-of-state teacher to come to Montana without any experience that, that can be verified, we're gonna make sure then that we get them into one of our areas, perhaps where they're needed the most, and then we support them in staying there. And that is verified through their district and through the Office of Public Instruction that they have that plan in place. Um, and we could do that with our pre-service who are doing uh, something like maybe an advanced student teaching model for a year where they're uh, working in a district, but also as they're getting district support uh, and they've been hired by the district, but they're getting district support, EPP support as they complete their process. We can do that with a teacher coming in from out of state verify that they're getting that mentorship support uh, and, and also drive them perhaps through this licensing mechanism to say, okay, if you take a job at a high needs area, stay there for two years after the, after the second year of staying there, plus a mentorship program, you can move into a full license. Um, and then I think that we could do that with all of ours, but mandate that, that mentorship. And I do know that there is that mandate out there for districts to provide that. Um, however, I, I think in addition to uh, whatever may be happening at the district, um, I know for, for a fact that MSU is really creating a, an innovative model right now um, for their Rural Teachers Project, and it's a two-year post-back mentorship uh, that they can do pretty soon on the hub. And I, and I believe, and I hope I'm not mistaken, I believe that their intent is at some point to open that up for folks. And it doesn't have to be just for folks who are graduates of their rural teacher project. It could be uh, folks who are graduates of other programs and it doesn't just have to be the MSU uh, platform. Um, but I think there's some real opportunities for us to use this license and be very prescriptive that if a new teacher comes into out of state, let's get them where we need them. And if they come into out of state, in, in from out of state without experience and they go to a, a school that's on the quality critical educator shortage list and they stay there for two years and we provide mentorship for them two years, folks might be willing to say, okay, maybe we can do that in exchange for some of those years of experience. But let's not just open the gates and say you can come in and you can come in with only three years or less um, without making sure that we're using this chapter to say, come to Montana, we've got a job for you in some of these high needs districts, but we're gonna expect you to take it with the pledge that you're gonna participate actively in this mentorship program and then sign off on it uh, along with your supervisor at the end so that you can move into a, a full license. And so that is a long story, kind of a long explanation, but I, I think that that's perhaps what we could do here, but it involves consideration of that tiered structure along with what we would do with all of these pieces that, that you have, have outlined here. Um, yeah, so and, and, I mean, it might look different too for, for a spouse, a military spouse. I mean, there may be a, a different track there too for military spouses. 
um, whose families uh, and spouse are so honorably serving our country. I think there's some real opportunities for us to do something magical in getting folks where they're needed and keeping them there with this licensure piece. And I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I've just kind of outlined where I think some of the possibilities are. Yeah, thank you, Angela, for that clarification. Some nuance there though, because because then like we're when we're thinking about this five to three years, that's specific to teachers from out of state who went through alternative programs, right? So uh, it's it's clear that we all understand an out-of-state teacher who comes with a license who can demonstrate a past praxis test, they get a license in Montana, more or less, right? Like that's a relatively clear path. Um, and so then that ties into the praxis issue. So and then the six credit hours, again, that conversation is specific to someone who comes from out of state who has had a lapsed license uh, in the past five years. Then they need to do the six credit hours. So those are, you know, those two bullet points are around some relatively specific cases, but um, certainly Angela's talking about what I hear you saying, Angela, in that conversation is we need to think about what are those cases who may come from out of state who would then enter into the support program versus having to have these requirements of years or, or what does it look like? Really, we don't know, but there's some, there's some group of people who are coming from out of state who might think about having the support program built in. <clears throat> Angela, this is Julie, just a question about that, Jacob. So when I'm thinking about this is, um, so when you look at the first bullet, right? Um, that's somebody with a lap, uh, license that has expired. Um, and we're saying you gotta go back to school. Um, when I look at the second item, and I see there that somebody's gone through an alternative program and they don't have five years of experience. If they have anything less than five years experience, the only way they can come to Montana is to go back to school. And so um, are you suggesting, Angela, in your model that there could be other ways that folks can demonstrate um, gaining uh, the knowledge or the skills to move from a provisional to a standard teaching license or a professional license in other ways than just going back to formalized um, school. Like the top bullet, well, maybe there's other things they do in participating in PD or mentorship, but it doesn't require them to actually go back and get university credit. Um, and I did have one question based on some of the chats that are showing up in the praxis. So that's my first question to Angela. And maybe I should pause there and let her answer, but here's the second question. I'm hearing a couple of things around bullet number three. Is the intention there to remove the praxis requirement for only out-of-state applicants who hold another license somewhere else? Or is part of the conversation to remove the praxis for all people in state and out of state, because I heard that's kind of what Karina was alluding to. Um, and so I just didn't know if that is completely fleshed out because there are some questions in the chat about, is it something the practice at the university level that they only use to enter into an educator prep program, but not necessarily um, as a result to leading to their licensure. Um, so I'm I'll gonna be quiet, that. two key questions. Yeah, so. So the, the it's important to note the first, our first row here of bullets is specific to teachers who come from out of state. So that bullet is specific to those coming from out of state who have an out of state license that is in good standing. The recommendation last week was to remove the praxis, additional praxis requirement for that. The second row around the in state Jacob, teachers. That's only, only for teachers who have another license. Correct. If you're coming from out of state and you don't have a license and you just graduated from a program, it's saying that you still would be required to take the practice. Well, that gets to that initial license piece, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't have a license yet. So it'd be their initial license, which is sort of the in-state teacher kind of falls in that umbrella. We did not get a chance to have that conversation. Angela, I think Julie asked you some questions. Sorry, I interrupted. Okay, so I didn't know if you wanted me to answer the question about the practice. I think that we've talked about both, or maybe there's even more than two out there now, models of what we could do with that. Um, and, and I think that it's an if then this kind of a conversation. Um, I, I think that's, that is what it would look like for me. 
um, if we could do this on this end, then we might consider doing this uh, for, for out-of-state applicants who have previously obtained a license but want to come teach in Montana. Um, so, I mean, I, I just think that there, there might be different uh, circumstances that might lend themselves to, you know, what a committee might uh, consider would be a reasonable step to uh, get back to what you started with initially, Julie, uh, is uh, licensing someone from out of state uh, and putting them in a classroom and providing them the support that they need to support students in that school and in that community. So I think there's just a number of different models and scenarios that, that could play out with any of, of these items that you have up here. But I think it would really depend on, on what the committee's threshold would be, where their interest would, would be. But I think that there's a real opportunity for us to consider uh, each of these pieces uh, and what those um, situations might, might shake out to look like. And also consider what we're hearing from this group as, as real or perceived barriers to getting those folks in their schools where they're needed. Sharon, and then we'll come to you, Sean. Thank you. And I guess I'd like to address a little bit of what I've been hearing a lot about continued support. And I, I'm talking to you from a very isolated southeastern Montana school in Ekalaka, knowing that we've often been promised support from the Office of Public Instruction and from the university system with regard to internships. And rarely does it actually happen in person um, where we really need that. So while I completely support what I'm hearing about perhaps a tiered licensure system, which by the way, it seems like a tiered licensure is already sort of built in when we have this 5A and the if thens that Angela was talking about, but. And I completely agree with the support folks need if they don't pass the praxis or the support that they need um, during this mentoring time. We don't really see that in our rural schools. And it's the rural schools, I think, that keep coming up as um, needing the help for retention here. So I, I think that I, we would all enjoy having that support. And I think as somebody on this committee, I'd enjoy hearing before we make a recommendation like that, what's our capacity to provide that? And if I could just speak, I don't think I was necessary. I was answering Jacob's question. And I guess the recommendation I think would really have to be something that a subcommittee of this group would have to sit down and come together on and address so much of what we've heard. But I think it would have to be after two, we had heard more data, more research about the tiered licensure structures in other states. But I was asked to kind of reflect on what that could look like um, and then I guess just to your to your point about the in-person uh, mentorship, I mean, we know we have that component, component in rural where it should be happening. Um, and then sometimes that, that's a capacity concern, et cetera. And that's why I mentioned what MSU is doing online, not always perfect, um, but sometimes for rural, uh, it's, it's what we can do. And perhaps other strategies could emerge. And Dan mentioned the recess, which are another great tool. Um, but where I think there's a will, there's, there's a way. What I do know is that uh, we've, we have an opportunity here, I think, and the more I hear from the conversation to do something different with Chapter 57 that will get folks to where they're needed and provide a tool that will support them there. And I just, that would be my recommendation if we could have the committee hear more about the tiered licenses and then determine if there's interest in, in further in a group sitting down and saying, here's what we could do with our licensure structure structure, and then bring it back to the group and, and also consider these four pieces as a part of it. So Sean, and then after Sean, Karina, I see that you want to speak. So we'll go Karina after Sean. Sure. Hey, um, um, Angela, I really like the direction that you're thinking on that. I think that's really useful and I think it's really valuable. Um, you know, and, and, and the next point around this, I said, I've got three points. The, the first was, um, was just that around uh, the, again, the direction that Angela is thinking on this. Um, and, and I'm in full agreement. The, um, you know, and I think these points, this conversation is not only around retention of teachers uh, in rural schools, but also for the recruitment of teachers in rural schools and larger schools. So I think, think these are all very, very valuable points. Now, and, and, and I think finally, uh, we, we see a screen here that just simply says out-of-state teachers, and then and then we keep hearing about 
uh, you know, but this first bullet is only for this group and this third bullet is only for another group. And, and, and I would like to see more clarification around which particular groups these particular bullet points are referenced to. Uh, because, um, you know, it becomes a little bit confusing in, in considering one bullet and then in a second and a third bullet around different groups. Um, I, 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 again, uh, maybe I'm just uh, confused. I'm confused most of the, most of the time. But, uh, but this, this certainly doesn't, the structure of this certainly doesn't help me understand which particular group, which particular bullet point is directed toward. So, so I would just hope for some clarity around that or some, some re-editing or something like that, right? So Sean, when you were talking about grouping, I was also thinking about some kinds of grouping, right? In licensure, our goal is to get them licensed. And what happens after that, right? In terms of the retention or the growth or the development of someone that really, or even if they get a job, that's no longer a licensure function, right? And so when I'm thinking about licensure function, I'm seeing it really in a couple of categories, right? I see it as you get your initial license, which is you're certified to do whatever to teach in whatever area. Then there's the ongoing renewal to keep your license active. And then the third category is you may um, enhance your license, meaning go from um, a provisional to a standard or a standard to a professional, which is kind of how Montana is tiered, if you will, right? But within that, when we're talking about the, the multiple pathways, we're saying, what are the different multiple pathways that someone could show competency to become licensed? Then the second would be to keep their license active or ongoing, what do they gotta show? And then the third is around what would you need to show to enhance your license to move from, for example, standard to professional. Um, and so I'm thinking about these three categories because um, as I hear Angela talking about, she's bringing in something in addition to that. She's talking about, and that's what I'm, I'm not clear on Angela, if it's um, mentorship as a pathway beyond a test, or schooling or experience, but it's mentorship with experience that could lead to um, enhancing your license from a provisional to a standard or keeping your license active instead of taking 60 renewal units. I guess that's where I'm confused. So as Sean's talking about categories, I was kind of thinking not just in out-of-state teachers or in-state teachers, but also around what are the functions of licensure in those categories? Because kind of how the system is currently set up, it's not to really do much beyond provide the certificate. Right. Angela, before you go, let's let Karina speak if she's available, please. She, she's been waiting. The only thing I want to say is I, I agree that in rural schools in our smaller schools, it is a teacher retention, a huge teacher retention problem. I also want to reiterate that it is also that way on our reservation schools. Um, we have a, a continued problem with, with retaining teachers and it goes, and some of it I do believe has a direct result because of the praxis. Go ahead, Angela, and then we'll come back to you, Sean. Thank you, Julie, that helps. And I'm sorry if I missed the mark on my first long answer. I think we have a real opportunity to do both, bring a teacher in from out of state, put them to work in a district where they're needed and then support them. And so, so we know that once we hire, once we give them a license, right, that they have X number of years to meet certain expectations. And what I am saying is build into that X number of, into those expectations, uh, some prescriptiveness. And what I alluded to was uh, the prescriptive nature of two years of induction and mentoring support that, that they would verify, have, have the district where they've gotten their new job, sign on uh, and verify that it's about to happen. Then when they've concluded it before they can advance in their licensure, um, it is verified that they have, that they have concluded it. So I, I, I think to answer your question, I think I'd like to see us do both. And I don't know, I don't, know if it necessarily has to be just that mentoring piece. I mean, I think that that's too, again, what I would 
uh, love to delve into with maybe a subcommittee of this work. I think that there's a lot of, of opportunities for us to consider what would work for Karina's district, <laughs> what would work for Sean, um, what work, would work for Christine. Um, I mean, to really think about uh, packaging uh, those first expectations of a teacher comes in from out of state, what that would look like, or packaging those expectations uh, as far as coursework and mentorship and what those would look like for a pre-service teacher who is who is advancing uh, their model into the classroom and taking a job and, and filling a need there. I think that there's a lot of ways that we can go, but to your point, I think we can do both. Get them the license, but it has to be based on proof of A, B, and C. And then they don't advance if those haven't been delivered on. And, and you know, I think that there's some real opportunities there. Go ahead, Sean, and then Diane will come to you after Sean. Yeah, and quickly, uh, just, just back to kind of the, 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 the last point I was trying to make around this. And, and Julie, thank you very much for some clarification around that. Uh, in one of the early sessions, that we had, we spoke to uh, flow charting, for instance, or or understanding the the you know the the barriers around the different steps to get different kinds you know for around the different kinds of licensing. So so I think rather I'll go back to this point again, rather than just throwing four bullet items out on an out of state topic issue. Um, I, I think it'd be really valuable to actually more deeply analyze the 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 processes that are involved in, in what, what uh, potential teachers need to step through in order to be able to achieve certain kinds of licensure. Uh, it doesn't do me a lot of good just to see four bullets on the screen um, because there are different alternatives uh, or different, uh, different pathways, I should say, pathways uh, to get to those points for different kinds of licensure. So that would be really helpful for me to better understand the whole overall, um, the overall, overall situation through, and, and again, through an analysis or a flow chart uh, in, in, you know, in that kind of way. Thank you. Go ahead, Diane. Thanks. You know, I, I hear a lot of us and I think we're saying the same thing. I think we all want to try to figure out a way where we can uh, have quality teachers with some flexibility, but also without having the issue that we've seen, perhaps in some of our rural districts or other districts where things are started and promised and not uh, delivered. If, if, in my mind, if we wanna loosen up what we're doing to bring in the quality teacher that we need for our classroom, I'd like to look at some models where other states perhaps have been successful in, a, in other rural states <laughs> uh, and have been successful in in doing a, a tiered licensure where there are certain requirements that come into play and they're they've been provided and they've worked before we you know move along i'd like to hear more about that i'd also like to hear more about msu's uh, program that they're doing so i guess my bottom line is i'd like i'm i'm really open to the possibility i want it to be feasible for montana and i'd like to look more deeply into it Thank you, Diane. Any additional conversation around this point? Um, like this is Julie. I was wondering, um, and um, I don't know if Karina is still there. Um, just a clarifying question. She said, you know, the praxis can be a, um, a challenge. And so I didn't know, Karina, if you were thinking of it in two ways, right? It's a, it's a barrier for them to even get to licensure. But it sounds like it could be potentially an and there. It's also a barrier of if they're given a provisional license of a 5A and then they don't pass it within that year, then they, they can't have the license. And so I didn't know if it was both that you were alluding to um, from the praxis or one or the other. Karina, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, I would say both, um, but it, we've had some, awesome teachers that just couldn't pass the praxis. Uh, a majority of them, you know, come, it just depends on their experience where they grew up and, 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 and that has a lot to play in it, I believe. In it. 
at some point, a lot of our indigenous um, teachers, some of them have problems, but other people do as well, you know, and some just take tests different. I never believe that tests, tests show what a good teacher is or isn't. I think what they do in the classroom and how they teach students, engage students in their learning um, is a whole lot more effective than a test but that's my own personal view. But it has been a, um, that's why we have lost teachers. So we flipped our meeting, but I hear from this conversation up before the group that uh, we're not ready to, send any of this outside of this meeting, outside of the fact of maybe a report that we are looking at licensure path, continue to look at licensure pathways, want to look deeper. And uh, we, we've, we've really identified some different types of buckets that we're looking at. There's the initial license. Uh, there's maintaining a license, as Julie said. There's potentially advancing your license. And then there's this sort of the other bucket that I don't think you mentioned, Julie, which is the out of state teacher. And within that, there's some different categories that we could have, but we're thinking about those buckets in terms of breaking down barriers. And Jacob, I just wanna throw one thing out there about the pathways and I don't know, I'm throwing a lot in today, you guys, I'm sorry. Why are we even distinguishing between out of state and in state? Does it really matter? I just have to say that for a minute. It just feels a little, Weird to me. That's all. Julie, let me. There's a pathway, up? isn't there? A pathway. Yeah. Thank you. And that's what I guess I was alluding to with my question in the chat. I I am an out of state teacher. You know, I came from two different states, and I'm just not understanding why it has to be different for in state or out state. Out of state shouldn't in state teachers also receive some sort of mentorship? Um, I, I guess I just. I'm not understanding and it. it's just creating more barriers and also more, more work for the, the licensure specialists to have all these different pathways. If it could be more consistent in state and out of state, I think that that would make a lot more sense. So I just wanted to follow up with that as well. Thank you. Mike, you have your hand up. Well, just in regards to Julie's question, for instance, when we were talking about assessment, when we were talking about out of state and in state, it was just regards to the praxis, where if a teacher came in and had a license from say Idaho and hadn't taken the praxis in the last five years, we didn't care. So, I mean, that, that was where we talked about an in-state versus an out of state, in particular, only uh, talking about the praxis. So that's kind of where that came up. I don't know if that's what you were, talking about with in-state, out-of-state, um, but that's where we had brought it up in the assessment part. Thank you, Mike. So, um, so Jacob, you said initial versus um, not initial, right? Uh, uh, um, and so does it really matter if it's out-of-state, um, in-state, right? Because you guys, we've got all these different categories. So it's initial versus experienced, out of state versus in state, and it's also traditional pathway versus alternative. So in some ways to simplify the process, shouldn't it be, what are the criteria that you need to demonstrate to be certified? And then how do you show that competency? And are there multiple ways to show it? Um, is it because if it's the test, then it should be the test for everybody, regardless of um, traditional, um, alternative, in state, out of state. I just feel like there's all these different categories that are currently in the system, and there could be some ways to really simplify it to just say, what is it that, that the requirements are? Everybody needs to meet A, B, and C, and these are the pathways that you can meet A, B, and C. Dan, go ahead. All right, yes. Um, so, Julie, I think we could eliminate those three of them right now. 
just by combining the in-state and out-of-state into one category. Just make it licensure, um, no matter what it is. I mean, we I think it would be we'd be better off if we'd saved, you know, your headaches and, and the division's headaches for licensure if if it was all simpler. Um, and, and the fact that the traditional pathway versus non-traditional pathway, that is um that is a question that just needs to go. It just needs to be licensure pathway, um, as we've learned in the last year specifically. Uh, I, th I think just simplifying it to a way and, and eliminating some of this red tape. Now, I know, you know, there may have been issues in the past with things, um, but I think that's also something where you, you count on, um, you know, with your, with your schools that, that have to hire someone who is non-traditional in gaining licensure, um, you know, to maybe fulfill a little bit more. I mean, that was, that's something I would gladly do in order to make sure that I had a teacher in a classroom and who was qualified by working with that person throughout an entire year or two. So, I mean, I understand all the different issues that currently exist, but I sure would love to see all that shrink at least by half. Mm -mm. Right, sure. Well, I guess I'll, I'll be the one that, that disagrees there in part. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of talk, I guess, about what I'm, and I'm hearing that again about local control. Um, and whether that's in state or out of state is something that we do need to continue talking about. But local control looks very different um, in every district, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. In fact, we wouldn't even have a state licensing bureau. Um, some states in times of need have actually um, allowed their own districts to license their own teachers. And, and I think it bears looking at um, screening candidates in an appropriate way to make certain that all of our schools um, have the same high quality teachers that they would expect from a state licensing bureau. Our school does hire teachers at the very last minute. We do hire um, administrators and counselors who haven't quite met everything yet. Um, our local will never blame themselves for hiring um, a person who is not highly qualified. They'll blame the state licensing bureau for that. So I think it is incumbent upon us as a as having been on this committee to take a careful look at, and I know that there's a lot of conversation about streamlining and um, making everything faster and getting teachers in the classroom from out of state and from in state as quickly as we can. But as a teacher who taught for a long time in a small district with um, all sorts of folks from all places. We're in Montana, in Eastern Montana. So we had teachers from everywhere come here. And um, we, we've had all kinds of degrees of success with that. But I do think that our local district looks to this licensing bureau to um, have quality teachers here and that streamlining that, I, I guess I'm misunderstanding maybe our intent of this, is, is our intent really to get people in licensed as quickly as we can, or is it that we need to be very careful and make sure that they're quality candidates as quickly as we can. So um, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I guess I could follow up a little bit with that, Sharon. And I don't think it's just to expect, you know, just to get teachers in and not make sure that they're quality. But I can tell you that um, being the licensure director, I'm in charge of all emergency authorizations. And in just this past week, I've gotten 15 and asking for the quick turnaround. So um, I think it's trying to find the right mix to say, you know, making sure that um, we're getting quality teachers and we're getting the right candidates in, but also, you know, wouldn't we rather a pathway for teachers that, you know, as we're talking in state, out of state, rather than just getting an emergency license for somebody that's not even necessarily qualified for the position. So I, I, I think that it kind of can be both, 
I absolutely do not want to take away from it being a quality candidate. It's not just, you know, us shipping them a license and saying, well, it's a body in a classroom. I don't think anybody wants that. However, I can tell you that we're only seeing more and more emergency authorizations coming in, and especially in areas um, that maybe they shouldn't be. Um, so it's, it's a real concern. And I think it's just trying to figure out the right mixture, so to speak. So I appreciate that input, but I, I do want to say, I think that it can be both. So I'll add just a minute that too, Crystal, that, that maybe help ground us in that. I would make a strong argument. You will not solve the teacher retention or recruitment issue through licensing. Uh, arm, you can you can potentially improve it, right? You could it is, but it is a single variable and a large difficult equation uh, that, that adds up. So um, that that's that balance piece that Chris was thinking about. I right? just uh, making sure we're, we're keeping that balance. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I, I agree with Crystal and, and what she's speaking to. You know, and, and in my mind, what what when we're talking about uh, licensure, you know, I, in my mind, what we're here for is to try to try to provide the maximum flexibility, you know, in the vetting and the hiring process while continuing to provide a structure that maintains quality candidates. So developing licensure, whether that's in state or out of state or, or just licensure, um, you know, that seems to be the, the goal to me um, around this process. Thank you. John. I just wanted to follow up quick on, on Crystal's comment. Um, I know it's probably not the place of this committee, um, but it seems like if we really wanted to impact um, some of the licensing um, obstacles, perhaps recommending that we fully fund and staff um, Crystal's unit so that they can actually turn licenses around um, that would be a fantastic uh, argument, I think, that this committee, even if it's not an official recommendation, um, you know, I don't know how many licenses Lori and Becky process, because uh, I'm not in that office, but I know how many we send them on a regular basis, and they do a lot of work for two people, and um, perhaps there may be a way that we could suggest that maybe they, they look at allocations and, and perhaps they need to hire one or two more people to come in and help process those licenses as well. No matter what processes we change, uh, if we continue to add more work to people that are, are, are um, doing their best to keep up with the work that's there, um, but can't keep up, uh, we, we just make the problem even worse. Um, and then I, I really liked what Julie was talking about with the out-of-state versus in-state and uh, uh, not creating two different structures of licensure that we have one structure of licensure. So um, just wanted to put a plug in for uh, Crystal and her crew. They're doing good work with, with uh, you know, limited resources and whatever we can do to help get them a little bit more. I think, I think we should do it. Go ahead, Diane, you have your hand up. I'll be brief. I think John is right. I know during the legislative session, there were there was a 12% vacancy at OPI. And I know it's difficult to get workers in many, many places, but given that we have a, a real important need to get uh, folks uh, licensed uh, quickly and meet the requirements or notified that they don't, I think that that would be a message that I would uh, appreciate us sending as a group so that that make that a, a priority and i don't know what if there is um, a vacancy in this department or not and i know we're treading into an area that might be a little different but i think it's an important one jewel go ahead thank you i agree with everything that has been said i think that should be our number one recommendation um, and it could be submitted um, quickly um, as to assistance for them in helping process all of the applications.
So yes and yes, you guys, right? Like uh, definitely, you know, um, there is the demand of the job, right? And certainly could use um, more people. Um, and I would say uh, also you guys though, regardless if we had 10 licensure specialists instead of two, um, some of these issues are providing some barriers to getting qualified applicants in. There are qualified teachers, for example, that might've gone through an alternative program who had four years of teaching experience and they're not able to get here without going back to school because they don't have that fifth year. So I think it's both. We certainly can improve the production, if you will, at the OPI and the rate of um, evaluating. Um, and also we need to take a look at what our requirements are to say, how do we ensure quality without so much redundancy in the rule and, and, and it not being so inequitable because currently the way it sits, there's an assumption there, you guys, that there's something different between a traditional and an alternative program or something different between if you're prepared out of state versus in state. And so I just bring that forward to you. I think it's both of what you're talking about um, and that uh, the rules um, are really critical. There's pieces in there, you guys, with the pathway that say, we have notaries that have to be filled out, university recommendations, transcripts. There's all these different components that folks must submit as document, as proof to what? It's some kind of quality measure. What are those measures? And are there more than one way to show that you have your pedagogy, that you have your content, um, and that you are the kind of teacher that we want in our schools? So, um, I appreciate the conversation definitely about the staffing um, and, and um, that's helpful. And I also wanna kind of say, I wanna come back to um, these different pathways and all these different things do in many ways are very cumbersome. There's lots of layers at times. Julie, Sharon mentioned knowledge of, a, of some sort of a flow chart that made more sense of the pathways that OPI has. Are you aware of that? Of course, Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Is that it's something on the we, website? <laughs> it is on the website? OK, uh, yes, Trish, a, could we, we have get a that in the things. chat? We have, well, yeah, I can jump in in the chat. I have to go. I'm kind of, Jacob, I'm in, the, in a corner of a hotel room. Well, so. <laughs> Tristan, Tristan, I, I, maybe Tristan could do it for us if she knows where it is. I tried um, to look and I cannot get the OPI website to actually open. Um, mm -hmm. I know we've had some technical errors today or technical problems. I don't know, Tristan, maybe you'll have better luck. If um, someone I can, can direct it. me to where it's at, I can grab it. I'll get it. I'll Go ahead, Sharon. I'll tell you. Oh, where and okay. Thank you, Julie. It was me who mentioned that. And uh, yeah, thank you, Julie, for finding that. And the only reason I know about that, of course, is because when I was chair of the Board of Public Ed, um, we saw many times through the folks who brought it as far as the Board of Public Ed, that form that indicated which piece um, they were missing. And it was a great flow chart form. So, so we were efforting to get that to the group. That seems like a very useful tool. Um, to help us visualize everything that we've talked about. So we've had great discussion today. Uh, I, you know, we may not leave with any many quote unquote bullet points, but we've definitely made progress. Uh, I, I wanna plant seeds, I guess, to move us into the next meeting and ask about the next meeting. Uh, so we were gonna talk about endorsements today. So let me plant these seeds of areas within endorsement that we know are, uh, difficulties and or areas of consideration to think about in terms of teacher candidates. So one thing within Montana currently that there are broad endorsement categories. So when I say broad, it's like K-8 versus having a specific middle school endorsement. Uh, and there are reasons and context for that. One of which is many of these state schools are rural and they therefore are K-8 schools. So having that broad endorsement makes it much easier to have a more flexible teacher within that school building um, and and that's useful now what, what you could potentially run into then is with states who teachers are coming from out of state so i know we're talking about you know this kind of 
license your piece. So as we think about that moving forward and breaking down the barrier of being in state or out of state, uh, there's the consideration now of alignment of endorsements, right? So if I came from, I'm just making this up, so nobody write this down. If I came from Wyoming and I was 6'8 certified and that endorsement did not align in Montana, then there is some level of difficulty to determine exactly how that would convey at this point. Okay, so as we think about moving forward and recommendations, there's there's that consideration around endorsement. One thing we've talked about previously is also that uh, you know if, if a national board certified teacher comes uh, and you're in, endorsed in a national board area, those endorsements do not line up. They have some specialty areas and they also have some grade level areas as well, but they're not directly aligned with what's in. Uh, in Montana. The other piece to consider is, is there is no middle school endorsement in Montana, again. So that's just something that many other states have that, that Montana does not have. And then there's the process that Julie talked about of sort of advancing your licensure. And if you think about advancing in terms of adding an endorsement, uh, currently in Montana, to add an endorsement requires additional coursework through a university system. Whereas many states, uh, you, you can add endorsements to your license by simply passing the assessment that goes along with that endorsement. So this also ties into our conversation around praxis, because uh, generally this would be some form of praxis test. But the example would be, uh, in Texas, I know for sure, I obtain a license as a K-2 elementary teacher. Once I've got that first license, no matter what it's in, I then can go get essentially an endorsement and or the ability to teach any other subject in the K-12 realm if I can go past that endorsement test, right? So I could be a K-2, this is a broad example, but I could be a K-2 certified teacher, that's my first license. Then I could go take a high school biology exam and get that endorsement and teach high school biology if, if I pass that exam. So there's in other states, oftentimes much more flexibility to add those endorsements onto a license to be able to, to make yourself more flexible uh, and have more, uh, just more ability to teach within the K-12 school system in terms of endorsements. Sharon. Okay, so to clarify that, and that was my question on when I looked at the chart about endorsements. You had a um, could consider allowing teachers that hold specific content area endorsements to teach out of their endorsement areas, particularly in rural schools. So let me raise this like to my level, maybe. Um, I was a high school math teacher. I'm also endorsed in English. So under that argument, then are we maintaining that it's okay, maybe that we should relax that? And then let me be able to be not just teach, but perhaps be assigned to teach uh, science. Because if that's the case, I heartily disagree. <laughs> I, I could maybe pass a science test after studying. I'm a pretty good test taker after studying that, whatever content area you're talking about, but I am in no way qualified to teach that science. I needed a degree for that. And that's what chapter 58 is probably about too. So, so Sharon, I, your understanding is correct. I think it's important to note we are discussing an outlier case most likely, right? I mean, there, it's not necessarily, I think the norm that someone would go on to teach science if they don't want to or aren't qualified to do it, but it could happen. That's the, that's the piece, right? Um. So I think that Sharon, what you're bringing up is um, different on, among all three of these bullets, right? So when we talk about the first one, if you are an out-of-state teacher who has an endorsement to teach history, US history only, um, you can't get an endorsement for broad field social studies. You would have to go back to school to take some coursework to get that broad field social studies so that you could teach uh, geography, economics, government and such. So that, so it kind of plays out different with that bullet, right? 
Right. And and I'm aware of that. And also the same mm-hmm. is true of certain areas in science. And I am I'm absolutely aware of the social studies one, because some of our social studies teachers are actually unable to teach U.S. government because of what you're talking about. But I think we just have to be careful about how far open, how far we throw open that door. I just wanted to share that it was different basically between one, two, and three of these bullet items, which you're mentioning. Mm-hmm. Okay, so our discussion that Sharon was in is really about the flexibility of, a, of adding endorsements within once you're licensed in Montana, then what, what, is, what does the process to add an endorsement look like? Currently it requires additional coursework. Uh, is that too restrictive? Is it not? Is it fine? Uh, is sort of where we are. Philip. Yeah, could you define many? What, do you have a number associated with that? You said many? Yeah, many states simply require passing a test. What is that? I don't have a count on what that is specifically in terms of the 50 states, okay. um, but we could certainly get that for the next meeting or we will investigate getting that. Okay. Thank you. Any other last comments on this before we have a kind of look at where we are and then have a short discussion about our next meeting? Philip, did you have another comment? Yeah, I did. Uh, just one other thing. Um, maybe somebody in the department, Julie, could answer this. Um, really, how this got me to this Tiger team here. Uh, um, the question on why is Montana? Okay, so my endorsements are in history and broad field soil studies, and I was teaching um, industrial arts on a you know just for a semester, and looked at maybe doing that longer. Okay. Um, and started looking into the licensing aspect of that, what it would take, and certainly it would require additional coursework, which I was considering, okay, going back to school. But then we came up, and this is the one sticking point that I just don't understand is this aspect that in your lifetime, I guess, in the state of Montana, you, are, you can only get one provisional license one class five. And I, I just don't under, so you could still, okay, well, I can still teach shop while I'm taking these other classes, but that's, you can't do that in Montana. So you would have to disconnect from that, finish up all that additional schoolwork. Then, uh, you know, I guess get your regular, you know, an additional endorsement in industrial arts. Could you just, somebody just, why is that only one provisional per a lifetime, I guess? So to so, answer your question, um, you can do, there's a couple of things beyond a provisional license. There's called internships. You could be adding an endorsement while teaching in the area you wanna be endorsed in. For example, what you're bringing up the industrial arts. Um, and then you could do an internship um, and then you have to, you know, be going to school and have a university sign off on it, the superintendent of the district. And then you could go through an internship, meaning um, you're working with the college, um, but it's not a provisional license, if you will. But in order to qualify for an internship, you have to hold at least a class two license. You couldn't hold a provisional. Sean? Yeah, um, 
So the, the question is this, and, and I understand regarding endorsements that you can go ahead and go back to uh, school, take some additional coursework to be to go ahead and be in, endorsed in a certain area. I just want to step back to my my own primary uh, field, which is um, the the tech field, and and you know again there are certain certifications that the person can go ahead and take certification exam, security plus, network plus, so on and so on and so on. Uh, that, that really kind of endorses you to go ahead and and work in a particular area. Now now with that said, with that said, um, and 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 I'm familiar with some aspects, and 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 this is one of those areas I'm not familiar uh, within. What are other states? Um, outside of the coursework, what do other states do or are there other kinds of, of uh, tests or, or, or um, alternative programs, if you will, and I'm not really sure what I mean about that, that will allow you to basically take a test to get an endorsement. And when I say take a test, I, I mean that really liberally. So, so you know, uh, what, what is the process or other processes that, that you can go about to get an endorsement? Um, uh, you know, to teach something outside of your original endorsement area. Did that make sense? Did that question make sense? Yeah, Sean, this is Julie. I'll answer your question. In other states, you can add an endorsement by taking an exam like the Praxis. In some, you can also um, do it with through um, taking an exam and having years of experience of teaching that. So say you taught a section of science and you teach four sections of math, if you've done that for three years and then you pass the, the science exam, then you could add that endorsement without having to go through a formalized um, preparation program or back to the university. Do we have those science exams, for instance? Do we have those within the state? Those would be the praxis. Okay, okay, so it's a content area. Uh, science, history, or whatever, that would be specific to taking, going back and, and retaking the praxis for that particular content area. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair. And I think we currently require a minor for that to happen. Is that correct, Julie? we require a minor in an endorsement area. Um, it depends on Sharon, like the university, they would take a look at your coursework and it depends on what they would, what their requirements are to, um, for, for, a, stu for a, a candidate to get that endorsement. We don't like count numbers of credits and say it has Got to it. be a minor, if you will. It's all I on the that. education preparation program for them to determine what they would require for an endorsement. Uh, and another question, Julia's follow-up, is there then, there's methods of teaching science, there's methods of teaching biology, methods, is that correct? Do you look for that too? We do not look for any particular coursework, no, in terms of if, if it's like methodology courses and then like say biology class and then, you know, methodologies for teaching. Mm -mm. We okay. only look for a recommendation from a university for that endorsement. Okay, that clarifies that. My question maybe is though then more for um, John. Yeah, we have specific methods for different content areas. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Okay, thank you everybody. We're at the, at the end of our time. Uh, we're on the calendar for the 12th and the 19th, as well as the 26th. We recognize that this is gonna run into some schools starting, which could impact schedules. Um, given where we are now, if this causes difficulties, um, maybe let Crystal know, and we can look at making adjustments moving forward. Uh, in terms of time, but we certainly need to meet uh, and think about how we're going to move forward. In terms of the next meeting, uh, I heard an ask from Angela uh, that we did not get to put before the rest of the group, and that's some more information on the tiered licensing systems in other states. Does everybody think that would be helpful? Just a thumbs up real quick. If you think that'd be helpful, we try to get that to you, and maybe we could look at that starting off the next meeting. Seeing all yes. thumbs, people who have their calendars on. Okay, Diane, go ahead. 
That was a thumbs up with a bad okay. click. Thanks. No, thanks, perfect. So yeah, so we will uh, work to compile some information on that. I do know there is uh, one report that exists that's pretty succinct and has some links to other states that have done it uh, that are useful from the National Council on Teacher Quality. So we may be able to get it done with one piece of reading and we'll get that to you before Monday. Uh, that will be useful. <clears throat> and then we'll start the next meeting by looking at that and digging into, I think, what our next steps in terms of format and process can be to make sure we can move along efficiently. Thank you, everybody. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up or right at the top of the hour? Thank you for the conversation. Again, I think we made a lot of progress today and, and moved us one step closer. I just want to say thank you, Jacob, Eric, Julie, Crystal, really just a, a great conversation today. And you folks have uh, extraordinary patience <laughs> in facilitating all of this good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye everyone, thank you.